Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of Grace to All with Paul Gray and my friend Richard Murray is with me again. Those of you who watched us a week ago, um, we were wearing the same clothes, but I want you to know that we, we have showered and sort of shaved. And uh, <laughs> oh, Richard, thanks so much for, uh, for being back for another episode. I really appreciate it. Glad to be here, brother. Thank you. And we were, we were uh, talking uh, uh, in between these two recordings. And uh, one of the things that I, I'm becoming more and more aware of, and it, 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 it really uh, hit me once again while, while you were talking, just about everything that I learned in religion was absolutely 180 degrees opposite of what's true. And, <laughs> and it, it's just... Man, it's just, it just uh, you, you can just go right down the line. When, when I started really seeing this, I, we still have our church that, uh, that I started uh, in September of 1991. But when we started getting this, I threw out the bylaws. I threw out the, all doctrines. I, I uh, did away with all committees and every, all that kind of stuff like that. And, and we just pretty much started over I, I guess they call that deconstruction now uh but uh, i don't want to don't want to get to the deconstruction to the point of where there's nothing we believe in uh but when we replace that wrong thinking with the truth well that's when it gets that's when it gets good isn't it well you know and really if you look at the bible we can see that same pattern in the bible you know people uh people um there's a concept that the church fathers would would call accommodation that uh so that god comes and and he doesn't he meets us where we're at and when we're talking about man-made religion everything that we first our first impulse is almost always wrong our first understanding because we have not uh separated soul from spirit you know hebrews 4 12 talks about separating what, what's of our soul from what's of the spirit and that's what Jesus, as the, as, as the Logos does, he separates it so that we can know the thoughts of intents of our heart. But God comes to the Old Testament believers in a brutal world full of sacrificial and violent theology. And he doesn't sit there and say, well, I'm not having anything to do with you guys because of this violence, because that's not what my son Jesus is like. No, he meets them where they're at. And he's trying to get to them where they're at with their violent religion to get them moving to start to get them moving toward the promised land in the Old Testament, which is, a, which is a physical type of a spiritual reality that is in the New Testament. So, I mean, when you were talking about deconstruction, you, you could say that the New Testament deconstructed the Old Testament, you know, and that's, that's what the Jews certainly, yeah. you know, that's why the Jews have a hard time with Paul, because they just believe, well, what is this guy doing? He's reinterpreting all these Old Testament passages in the light of Christ, where does he get the authority to do that? He's 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 deconstructing them. Where not now? There's some great passages in the Old Testament, so I'm not saying the whole thing, but yeah. but that's the point. The God was there with them, but just because they they kind of go off the the rail a lot, uh, they do get back on it because they're moving further and further up the timeline uh, to Jesus, and Jesus is the ultimate, uh, not just the deconstruction but the reconstruction but the church fathers believe that god comes to us in our in our in our mindsets no matter how harsh they may be and he, he won't try to just poke his finger at us and say you are wrong about all this stop thinking this way we can't take it you know at one point he started to tell him about satan in, in john 16 and he says i have so much more to say to you but you can't bear it now you know yeah. he, he accommodated where they were at so his see he plays the long game he, he's playing the long game to get us where we need to be we we play the short game now 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 you must have right doctrine now you must believe rightly now you must do this but when we start seeing the accommodating ways of god uh and it's not that he's not prompting us to grow and it's not that he's not exhorting us and encouraging us and even sometimes softly rebuking us to go but it's going to be in a way that we can take it no one knows our makeup more than he does he knows just how to what triggers need to be pulled and and the things that need to happen and uh, he wants a quality a quality work done in us and I, I always love Jesus' statement that it is through faith and patience that we inherit the promises of God and we need patience to grow and we need to understand when others have a hard time with what we're saying that they we have to accommodate them 
you know, uh, you're excellent at this. I've seen you operate and, and you're excellent. Brad Jerzak is excellent at it. He accommodates people where they're at. I'm, I, it's taken me longer because I'm, I'm, I'm can be an aggressive guy and I just want to shake people. I don't want to accommodate them. I want to <laughs> shake them into, you know, to realizing it, but, but I do it more than I ever have before. I, I've just given up trying to convince people. I just want to be, I just want to, I just want to do honor to what I believe, you know, yeah. and be, and, and me still grow. He's accommodate me too in my oh, aggressive. Yeah. Process. That boy, that, I really appreciate you explaining that. And, and, and he really is. And he, he does it so gently and so lovingly. And, and, you know, he, he, he does know each of us. He, he knows uh, what will uh, get our attention, what, when he needs to be stronger and this or that. But, uh, you know, he, I have a friend who always says each one of us is just right on time. And, um, and, you know, I, I will get in an unaccommodating uh, mindset with some people and uh i'll just I'll, I'll feel something coming and i'll be quiet and i'll hear the lord say paul 10 years ago <laughs> you were right where they are now are you are you gonna uh are you gonna bash them for uh being where you were and that yeah you know, that reminds me i was talking to somebody the other day for 10 years in the 1970s uh i owned some music stores and uh, there were other music stores in town and other stores close by. And uh, if if I would uh, start to lose customers and they would go to another store because their service. Well, I would try to find out why, you know, what is there? What can I do? Uh, what am I not doing that they don't? What's what's causing that? I didn't put up signs in my store saying so and so used to shop here, but the dirty, dumb <laughs> So and so's now go somewhere else and have nothing to do with them. They're they're, they're heretics. <laughs> but but you know what? That's kind of what religion does. When when people start asking, maybe you haven't found this, but uh, when when people start asking questions <laughs> and uh, uh, not going along with the party line, all all of a sudden we're labeled heretics, and there's a sign up saying have have nothing to do with them. When maybe what we should be doing is is saying gee i wonder why this is happening i wonder if they I wonder if there's something we're not doing right exactly exactly and and uh you know um i uh i have you ever seen those uh pixelated picture you know what a pixelated yeah. picture is don't you? yeah you know and you've seen like pixelated abraham lincoln you can tell it's him but you, you there's you don't see the definition on it and jesus yeah. pixelated jesus well, I had, I, I finally, I saw one of my areas where God moved me from. I used to have to have theology laid out. I, I would give people answers that had to be so precise and perfect that I wouldn't stop until I could give a perfect answer. Well, you know, that, which is why I never stopped because I could never <laughs> give a perfect answer. But uh, one day, one day the Lord was just you know, speaking to me kindly and softly and said, look, you just need to get enough to have a pixelated answer okay because you're dealing with metaphysical truths that that aren't seen that we're not you're not dealing with logic you're dealing with metaphysical cosmic truths that require omniscience to even fully understand why anything is the way that it is so be happy with the pixelated views that you get and um uh the word that he gave me was rough it's okay to have rough answers you know, you don't have to have a precise answer. There's beauty in roughness. Um, I, one of my Facebook friends is a, used to be a model, and she would tell, uh, she, when I shared this thing about the pixelation, she said that when she used to model for a famous artist and the artist would squint. Uh, we were talking about squinting her own, but this is a different kind of squinting, that the artist wouldn't paint her with his eyes wide open, he would squint at her. And that somehow let him see her in a rougher way, but let his imagination come in and paint her in a more imaginative way. Really? And I, I really love that idea. We, we uh, you know, some people talk about the sin of certainty, you know, and, but I don't really think it's so much certainty as it is the sin of precision. Like, I'm not going to believe something unless I've got it all A to Z figured out. And that ain't ever going to happen. But we can get enough of an answer, enough of a pixelated answer about God's goodness, about, you know, where evil comes from, about why things happen. 
you know, the way they do, why tragedies happen, why disasters happen. We can get enough of a picture, a pixelated picture of that to know that it's not God doing it. And there are a thousand pond ripples crashing into each other, you know, in a thousand different ways from a thousand different causes. Uh, secondhand smoke and all sorts of things like that. Not secondhand smoke, I'm using that metaphorically. Sure. Yeah. Uh, but, but a lot of things happen beyond our ability to know. And, and I'm okay with that. You know, I used to not be okay with it. I don't have to have the answer. I've got enough of an answer, enough of a pixelated answer that I know God is good and I'm never, I'm never moving from it. Uh, and, and I think once you do, the pressure's off of us and then we can start to maybe take some of that pixel, even see more. Not that it'll ever yeah. be fully not pixelated, but I think actually when we give up control over the thing, it'll yeah. actually, we'll see better than we will squint. We'll actually see it better. Yeah, you know, get, giving up things. I uh, again, like we said before, what what we uh, used to believe was 180 degrees different. You know, I used to think I had to give up all of uh, you know anything that that brought me happiness or joy, and I, I've come to see well, the things I really need to give up are judging and having to be right and uh, condemning <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, uh, duality and. Uh, uh, thinking that and with separation and exclusion and you know those are good things to give up and yeah and, and the results are you know freedom and joy and peace <laughs> you know it's funny i posted something tonight i don't know if you saw it earlier but i was talking about my favorite exorcism that jesus performed mm -hmm. and it was when he cast the devil out of the out of our image of god all right, because that's really when we're talking about the Old Testament, you know, the Old Testament believers that Jew, Jews still to this day would believe that Satan is is God's enforcer, that he's the death angel, that he's he's God's enforcer. He's his ministry of a minister of wrath. They believe that Satan operates at the Lord's command, much like Calvinists do. You know, Calvinists believe that today. Yeah, the Calvinists in, in, in uh, Judaism have a similar view of Satan. You know, the Judaism would Judaism uh, would say that that Satan is an obedient angel, merely doing what God tells him to do and that the God uses him as as sort of his angry voice. OK, yeah. Calvin, the Calvinist would say that, no, Satan is a rabid dog, but he's on God's leash and God sicks him on who God wants to sick him on. So and that's what but, Calvin did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But under either scenario. You know that 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 God is is the ultimate source. Uh, God, you know, God is the ultimate source of evil. He's just using it for His own good. Uh, but 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 now Jesus comes in the New Testament, and He sees Satan falling from heaven. You know, remember that scene? He sees yeah. Satan falling, and I believe what that means is that Jesus came, and when the when the disciples started healing and doing all this stuff, G Jesus looks up and he sees Satan fall from heaven, which to me is him falling from the heavenly image of God. We, we had had a, we had had a, uh, a uh, we had them joined at the hip. We had Satan joined at the hip with God. And Jesus comes and he, he differentiates. I always say that the Old Testament saints often had a, what I call a glop, a G-L-O-P version, where Satan, there was this glop, and they would call wrath and love part of the divine nature judgment and forgiveness part of the divine nature it was all god and they had a very high view of god's sovereignty so they couldn't really perceive that satan was a off the grid rebel all right they they they, they couldn't believe that and i understand why they could but he clearly god has has given us freedom and he's given angels freedom and you know whatever you want to say satan is or he is but let's just take it he does represent evil he represents the source of evil but, but Jesus comes in the New Testament. What does he do? He separates, he differentiates his Abba from Satan and says, no. And, and, then, and then if we do it this way, we see Satan fall from heaven, leaving the Abba image up here, and the, which is the pure and pristine image of God as love and life. Folks, that's worth the price of admission. Uh, <laughs> just uh, Jesus, Jesus seeing Satan fall from uh, uh, our image of God. Man, Richard, that is that is so uh that is so good but while, while we're on that in, in the time we have left let's go back to something that you said at the end of the of the first interview uh when <clears throat> papa showed you that uh you were trying to get the devil to forgive him and uh and 
and and you mentioned that the devil will never forgive us, uh, and neither will God ever withhold forgiveness. Uh, can you expand on that uh, a, a little more? Well, yeah, I was feeling sorry for myself because I was I was operating in these cycles of self condemnation, and no matter what I did, I couldn't get past the condemnation of something that I did. It it, it, it operated for years to come back and just crush me, and uh, and then one day, you know, the Lord just prophetically prompted me and these insights to see that I was seeking the devil's forgiveness. Not, not that I was thinking because I didn't have, I had an undifferentiated view because of the condemnation. And I thought the condemnation was coming from God. And what God was trying to get me to do was to let Satan fall from that. But he was telling me that Satan will never forgive me no matter how many times I ask, which is why I kept asking and asking and asking in God's name. But I was attributing satanic qualities to the father where but so what he what he quickened to me was that satan will never give you forgiveness and i'll never withhold it you know so i was in the wrong source there i had that image my image of god during those times had become corrupted and i needed to do a purge you know every now and then we need to do a purge i think of, of something that's crept in our thinking that we think about god that's unworthy and uh when we do and we, you know, as I, as we said in the last session, we grow to resemble our image of God. You know, there's, there's a, a dynamic, uh, as Tozer said, it was a secret law of the soul that we gravitate toward our image of the divine. So if we have an image of the divine, and I draw my image of the divine from 10 verses, well, more than that, but I mean, my 10 favorite verses are in the, uh, Sermon on the Mount, John 5, 38 through 48. And that's where God, based, that's all the turn the cheek, love your enemy, bless those who curse you, you know, so that you can be perfect like your heavenly father who sends rain on the just and the unjust, who loves all. You can't get around that. that those 10 passages to me are the plumb line of the divine nature. And you can't, you can show me other verses that appear to say other than that, but right there, gee, that's the sweet spot of the New Testament right there about the nature of god at least yeah uh, oh I, I agree i i completely agree and that's uh um uh, you, you know you and i were both involved in in mike sinker's uh the conference on forgiveness and i don't think i heard anybody talk about what you were just saying about um seeking forgiveness from the devil maybe, maybe you did in one of your talks but i don't remember that probably didn't i don't think i did that, gosh that is just uh uh, well, I'm, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to think about that. I'm going to pray about that. I'm going to start teaching on that for the first two or three weeks. I'll say my good friend, Richard Murray said this after about a month, I'll say, I always said this. I mean, I've always known this. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it works. Because I'm sure I got it from somebody. Well, I, mean, I heard that from the Lord, but I'm not the first one to come up with that. I'm sure. But, uh, Boy, I tell you, it, it, it just shows you that the renewal of the and how important the renewal of our minds is. And, and you know, a lot of people, okay, I'll renew my mind. I'll renew my mind. I'll read some scripture and I'll renew my mind. Well, I'm not making fun of that, but I, I'm just saying there's actually something going on when we renew our mind. Yeah. You know, to me, it's this, this, you know, we could describe the differentiation, Satan falling, but the truth to be told, we have to continually re-monitor our thinking and see that the, the entrails of this satanic, the satanic things we accuse God of uh, are still entwined around some of our presumptions and our blind spots. And, you know, John Wesley, uh, man, he, he laid it out for his generation. He had to work through a lot more junk than we do, I think, because Calvin, he was so against Calvinism of his day. But what was he it had, he said? Calvin's God is worse than the devil? I Boy, think that's I, one of his I was about to get to. He oh, was taught, uh, some some pastor had died and uh, had uh, I believe had drowned, and uh, he uh, or some pastor's child. I'm sorry. Some it was a a uh, I, I believe it was a Methodist pastor's child had died, and the Calvinists these Calvinist pastors were saying, well, uh, the child died because of the sins of their father and being theologically wrong. So Wesley looked at him and he said, oh, your God is my Satan. You know, and I thought, man, is that not a beautiful way to put it? The God you're talking about is my Satan. And uh, even though it was sort of in an early stage, because, you know, Wesley had some wrath in other areas, but I, he was he knew he was repel, repulsed by Calvinism because Calvinism 
acknowledges the need for the devil. It acknowledges that the devil performs, you know, performs his function that he, and God, he doesn't do anything that God doesn't command him to do that. Satan only does what God commands him to do. And I'll tell you what, I'm out on that. <laughs> I'm out. Count me out. <laughs> Uh, I, I, there's, if I believe that, I would renounce my faith. If, if you told me yeah. that was the truth, I don't think I, I think I'd have to renounce my faith. Well, sure. I I love what uh, Paul Young the story. Uh, he was in uh, in England one time, and he'd gone there to speak, and the press was interviewing him. And I won't get this exactly right. Is it Richard Dawkins or Dawkins? Uh, the yeah, uh, you know, yeah. And uh, uh, they they asked Paul Young. They said, "Well, what 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 do you have to say about him being an atheist?" And he said, "Paul Young said, I don't believe in the God. He doesn't believe in either." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and uh, to me, that's the God of Calvinism. I don't believe in that God either. <laughs> but you know, you know, though, you know <laughs> something that the atheists do that's a little tricky. I've seen this dynamic, and it's sort of hidden in there. You know how we talk about. Uh, how Paul talks about don't read by the dead letter, but mm -hmm. read by the living spirit in 2 Corinthians 3. Well, what atheists do is they use the fundamentalist image of God. All right. So they'll use the primitive barbaric image of God. They won't ever use the image of God people like you and I are, are espousing because that's more reasonable. So there's a little bit of manipulation there, you know, where they, they set up a straw man using the stupidest view of God that any Christian has the most untenable view of God and the literal, the, the two literalists are atheists and uh, are literalists, fundamentalists, but also atheists because, th because that's an easy target. If they just approach the literal uh, things that, you know, that the Bible says about God, then they, he's easy to shoot down. It's like shooting ducks in a water, you know, uh, shooting ducks in a whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm, I'm not saying I'm, all atheists are that way, but, but, but some. Yeah. Are. I, I'm not disagreeing with you, but I have to think the reason they do that is because they've never heard of the version of God that Jesus revealed to us and that you talked about in the Beatitudes. So if, if they've never heard of that God, uh, I, I, well, I would grant, yeah, I, I would say there are many that are that, that, that haven't that yeah. have never heard it. I just happen, I've been dealing some with a particular atheist who was a Christian, renounced Christianity, but he was a, he was a Christian in the areas where you and I travel. He travels in our circles. Oh, and really? He, but every time he attacks Christianity, he's always quoting the fundamentalists and grouping us in with them. And I understand oh, really? he's, he's struggling and fighting and, and trying to, you know, justify where he's at. And, but, but I just, uh, I said, where did you get this? And every time I try to say, well, that, there are a lot of Christians that don't read that that way. You know, it just don't group us all in together. You know, they, yeah. there's more nuance to it. But uh, yeah, but yeah, you're right. A lot of them have never have never heard it. Yeah. And how should how should they know if they haven't heard? Um, yeah. But see, when the Christians themselves attack what we do, you know, what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, we kind of we kind of uh, you know, we get off the beaten path, and and uh, so we're kind of uh, we were talking. Mike and uh, Bill and I were talking about the other day about. You know, some people, um, the Greeks had this term, the golden mean. Have you ever heard of that? The, the no. Golden mean. How do you spell that? Golden. M-E-A-N. M-E-A-N. Uh -huh. Just the golden mean. That the truth is always found in, in the middle. You know, we go from the extremes. We go from the extremes to the nuances to the middle. And, and the best path is always the golden mean. And when I put that in Christian terms, um, you know, I, I, I think, uh, you know, Paul Bunyan, not Paul Bunyan, uh, uh, Pilgrim's Progress. That was Bunyan, but it wasn't, it wasn't Paul. <laughs> That's the fictional character. Uh, what was the name of the uh, Pilgrim's, Pilgrim's Progress? Progress was it, it's Bunyan, written. didn't it? I had it. Uh, Frank I had Graham. It. Yeah, I, but we I know what you're talking about. Anyway, the Pilgrim's Progress, the, the Pilgrim was safe as long as he stayed in the middle of the road. But Satan was represented in that story as, as lions, but with chains on them that couldn't reach the center of the road. Uh, but if you, if you deviated from the center of the road, then they could get you. Uh, and, and so the golden mean, you know, we might get, we might get, uh, we might be perceived as fence sitters because we don't really call ourselves anything. You know, yeah. we, we say this is right. This is right. We don't commit 
you know, we're not really in any camp. Right. And uh, so what, but my, my point is what might be called spin sitting is we're trying to walk the golden mean and just follow the Lord's highway, you know, which means that we, we don't necessarily commit to theological camps, you know, here or there or doctrine. Like you said, you did away with all your doctrine and all that. Well, that's, that's right. Because you want to, you, you're looking for the Lord's highway, you know, yeah. in the thing. But that we may be accused of fence sitting. Well, you guys don't believe anything. Well, that really sure we do, you know. <laughs> but I mean, people see the the progressive and see. I don't really like the term progressive, but you know, we get called that. Yeah. Uh, and some people need to be called that because they don't even really believe what you and I believe. But mm. but but we are trying to walk the path of non judgment and love and kindness, which requires us to be, you know, noble and considerate to our enemies. And we don't look like we're on the other side of the road. You know, we're trying, we're in, in, in that. Uh, so we're, we're hard to quantify. Now, that doesn't mean they don't try. They, they really do try to, but they'll call us fence sitters that can't, that don't really believe anything. Um, so anyhow, yeah. but I mean, that's, that's, uh, uh, that's what, that may be why it's hard for some atheists to pick up on what we're doing because we, you know, because we don't come across as, you know, uh, being evangelistic with our theology and beating, be, you know, jamming it down their throats. The fundamentalists do jam it down people's throats. Yeah. So, yeah. No, I, I, gosh, I'm thinking again, so many different things, but that's, uh, these are all fascinating things to think about. And, and, uh, uh, I, I would, uh, you know, I ask you, uh, in the very beginning of the first one, you know, what are you all about? I, well, I said, what's your goal? Uh, that, that wasn't a good term to use, but as we close the second section, I, I, I would say that when people, uh, uh, if people read my new book and they read about you and they say, well, I'm going to, I'm going to check this guy out. One of the things, one of the main things I think they'll find is someone who uh, uh, encourages them to think and consider uh, outside of the box of maybe where they've been. And uh and gosh, you, you do that in spades. Uh, and, uh, uh, well, it's just, uh, it's really helped me over the years. And I, I think it's helped lots of people. And I, I appreciate that very much. Well, I appreciate, I appreciate you having me. You know, the, the whole thing, I think Paul is, is we've been religion makes you scared to use your imagination. You know, you dare you, religion makes you use your imagination in fear to fear what's going to happen, to fear the or else, or to fear the hereafter. Whereas a sanctified imagination gets you, gets you imagining how good God is and gets you imagining how good God can be in any situation yeah. and how, how there's bigger, you know, bigger, there's bigger issues all around us, things, potential, potentiality swirling all around us. And uh, when we use that to, to, to uh, a sanctified imagination or what I like to call a spirit quickened imagination, dear Lord, everyone becomes a writer. Everyone becomes a preacher. Everyone becomes a theologian. You know, Paul, Paul called his Paul called the gospel, his gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the Pauline gospel. John had his Remember what John's gospel. We talked about it yeah. as God is life. That yeah. was his. And yeah. Paul would say it differently you know, but, but they would agree and it, they would resonate with each other. Paul, you have your gospel. You know, if I, mm -hmm. you know, pure, what does that say? Light Walker. I love yeah, that. Pure Light Walker. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Uh, I, I mean, I, thanks. Well, I, I think in what you're saying is, you know, we were told that imagination was not good, but uh, pure imagination is light and it will lead you to light. It'll lead you to love, uh, yes. with no darkness, uh, you know, unsanctified imagination will certainly lead you down the toilet. Um, see, see and, and, and it's in when it, when we use our own imagination, it's in our own emotional language. So it will it will be, you know, God revealed himself to me at a at a revival in Toronto as my wrestling coach. The people were praying for me and I, you know, I, I you know, I swooned in the spirit and they were praying over me. And he revealed it. He, he took me back to a wrestling memory I had. Uh, where, uh, you know, the, the, my wrestling coach took me under his wing in the eighth grade. And, uh, I've never had a man, you know, kind of notice me in that way and try to father me in, in, in that way. And he, he trained me and made me a warrior, but then our high school closed and I lost touch with him. But then flat, fast forward to my junior year, I'm in the finals of a wrestling match 
and I look around uh, and, and, and I'm not really close to my new coach, but I mean, he's okay. But I mean, we're not really not close. So I'm going out to fight this big gorilla on the other side of the corner. His name was John Harms. And I was, they always talked about being in harm's way, you know, but that Whoa. was his name. He was the strongest individual I've ever felt in my life. And, uh, but anyway, so I'm going out to face this big gorilla and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm struggling with a little bit of trepidation <laughs> on the thing. Uh, but I, I, I look behind me, my coach is back behind me, my, my new coach. And then the enemy coach is in the other corner. I glance over to the side, my coach, I haven't seen him in two years comes up and is sitting in my third corner over there. And anyway, so that memory is quickened to me on the mat uh, while they're praying for me in Toronto. And all of a sudden, God started showing me that he had been there for me in my corner from the beginning, that, that he was my wrestling coach, that he loved me and that he was training me. And that uh, he's uh, even though I didn't think he was there, he's always been there. He's always been in my corner. I just didn't see him. And Paul, that that day was transformative in my life. Because I, I saw God, I never saw any darkness in him after that. Really? You know, and it seemed it wouldn't last because I wouldn't, I just wouldn't believe lies about him because the God that loved me so much in my own emotional language, he used my own imagination with wrestling and brought out of that imagination, he brought a touch that is, is one of the most significant touches of my life. And to top it off, after they got through praying for me, I could not get up. I thought it was over and I tried to stand out and I couldn't get up. And I, I heard the Lord, and this is one of the times I did hear language pretty clear. I heard the words come up and say, you thought you could get up, huh? And he, had, he, he showed me, he put me in a half Nelson, and he was just kind of laying on top of me, and I couldn't get up. And I just started laughing and cracking up. And, th and then obviously, uh, you know, I got up after that. But it was just, that, that was a playful side of the Lord I didn't even know existed. Wow. Uh, that, that forever impacted. Everything that I, 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 I would say that everything that I share now goes back to that. 1992 experience uh that, that forever changed that's beautiful my gosh wow i wow that's uh i i just i don't have words to describe what uh, uh the things that you've said in in these uh, last two sessions but uh I, I, I'm going to do what I encourage my listeners to do. I'm going to go back and listen over and over again. <laughs> well, Thank I just you, would encourage you. I would encourage everybody to not be afraid of the images that, that, you know, the things that you like, God wants to speak through you through the things that matter the most to you. And that's going to be where you exercise your imagination. Uh, whether it's in books, stories, movies, whatever it is you enjoy. Uh, athletics, whatever, those are the, those are the, and most people know this, but, but then maybe they don't, you know, but I mean, those are the, rather than dry, stodgy sermons, you know, three point sermons, he wants to speak to you through imagery. He is a God that, you know, yeah. Jesus spoke nothing but parables wherever he went because images excite us. You know, they teach us so much more than words do. Oh, they do. I, I was, you know, I, being a, a jazz musician, I, I was, uh, when I uh, had a change, in, uh, a great change in, uh, in life, and I became a, uh, a music minister at a very fundamentalist church, I, I was told I had to give all of that stuff up and don't, you know, don't play Satan's music anymore. And all that. well, then since then, in, in the last, this last period of my life, uh, the Lord has helped me not only re-enjoy that, but to see him in all of these old stories, you know, like, like old, old standards, like over the rainbow and, uh, you know, just the things that, uh, I can see them now I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it. I, <laughs> I can see them now. I can see God in them. I can see God in the person who wrote those. Uh, I can see God in the people who are dancing to them when my band plays and, uh, you know, and enjoying it. Uh, and it's, uh, yeah, uh, it's just so well, good. Well, see, you know, when we were talking earlier about beauties in the eye of the beholder and how we have the power to beautify, that's exactly yeah. what you're doing. You're using your gift and your experience to beautify the whole experience. And what used to be, you know, people pointing their finger at, God, I know you're right. Everything we've been taught is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, and I know there are exceptions, but I mean, just yeah. the, it's all by the spirit, you know, and the, there's a spirit of it, a tone of it that's not right. It's condemning yeah. and fearful. And he wants he wants us to live in the happy tones, you know, and in the peaceful tones and in the and in the tones where we don't even 
you know, we don't even think, you know, we're not self-conscious. I, I don't know about you, but sometimes when I get self-conscious, I just go into lockdown, you know, uh, but when I'm not self-conscious, I usually have a ball. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. That, me too. Guys, Richard, this has been so good. And I, I, I so appreciate it. And as I don't want to finish, but, uh, uh, we need to. And so as, as we do get ready to wrap up, tell folks again, how they can connect with you and, and, uh, uh, the things that you have that, that they can access. Okay. I uh, have a website, the goodness of God.com. It's got a bunch of audio teaching on there, answering all, most all of the tough questions about God that would cause you to think that, you know, he would bash you over the head or that, you know, he's evil or that he sends evil or in destruction and all that. And I uh, talk about new Testament verses, old Testament verses, the book of revelation. We talk about it all um on, on those audios and, and they're free to stream uh, i've got some written resources there that are free uh some that are for sale a couple of books uh but i mean they're you know they're, mo the, the important stuff is free on there there's a big book uh the big book that i wrote that i really need to edit but i mean it's on there as a free pdf on the on the home page uh god versus evil is what it's called uh uh and developing an epic theology of god's heroic goodness that's the subtitle but God versus evil, that's on there. Uh, but the audio tapes, probably that's what most people really get blessed by. And then the Facebook, my Facebook posts uh, are where, where really my fresh writings are and where I really do most of my honing uh, of stuff that's in the book. I'll, I'll rewrite it on Facebook. Facebook can be a great asset if you know how to use it. Oh, yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I go back and I edit, you know, like every day I go in my memories and I'll take that and edit it, edit it and add some stuff to it and then repost it. And uh, so hopefully uh, one day I have 365 good writings, uh, you know, of, of various links on it. But Facebook friends, if uh, I'm, I'm close to my limit on Facebook friends, but you can follow, um, you know, you can follow even past 5,000. So if, if, I, if I'm not able to Facebook friends, you then follow and uh, you'll see some good posts, I think, and, and some good interactions because I got a ton of brilliant friends that love to talk and interact, Paul, you being one of them. Um, and, uh, and I'm friends with other brilliant, you know, thinkers. Um, and, uh, you talk about, you know, us having a worldwide web, you know, uh, mm -hmm. I was trying to explain some, somebody was trying to get me to go to church with them the other day. And I was trying to explain what my church was and they were just blinking, you know, <laughs> what? <laughs> I said, it's kind of an international, you know, loose affiliation of, of, of people that, uh, just spontaneously let the winds blow them together and you know, I said, yeah she was, uh, this person was a building person you know they were kind of identifying church as a as a, uh, as a building yeah uh, so, but 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 I, you know what i was proud that i couldn't explain it <laughs> because if oh, i that's good. It, I yeah. probably would have messed i probably <laughs> would have cursed it yeah you know? <laughs> well, that, that reminds me of the great old story of the uh, the little boy who invited his neighbor friend to come to church and Sunday school with him he said, well, I have to go ask my mom. And, uh, pretty soon he comes back and he says, no, I can't go. Uh, we belong to a different abomination. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Well, I, I value your friendship and I, I thank you for having me. And I always, you know, I can always tell, uh, <laughs> how good a conversation goes. You just draw it out of each other, you know, and well, we do. And I, I thank you for that. And I really do encourage people to, uh, uh, to go to your Facebook page because, um, there's so much, I don't know how you have time to be a lawyer, uh, because you put so much good stuff with so much research on there. And, uh, uh, it, you know, it just seems to flow so easily from you, but I appreciate it. And so do so many other people. And, uh, we're just grateful for you and for what you do and for who you are. Well, likewise, likewise to you, brother. Thank you. And stay online for just a minute and we'll chat for just a second, but I want to thank Thank everybody for watching us, for being with us for another edition of Grace to All with Paul Gray. See you all next time.